as we are getting closer to Christmas, Christmas Eve celebrations are just tomorrow, tomorrow evening. I wanted to share with you as we kind of go back in time, back in time to Isaiah, to one of the prophecies that Isaiah had spoken about the upcoming birth of our Savior. We know the, we know the prophecy. We said it many a time. But I want to spend some time, let's take it apart, let's put it back together and see how it all links together for you and for me as we celebrate this wonderful gift we call Christmas. We'll be right back to this episode of The Word. Yes, we want to go back in time to the era of the prophets, to the era of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Hosea, uh, Malachi, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Habakkuk, Habakkuk uh, Haggai, um, Obadiah, Jonah, uh, Malachi, Micah, and I know I'm missing a couple. I can never remember all of the 12 minor prophets. I am sorry about that. Uh, I, I'll, I'll put a list of all the 12 minor prophets at the bottom of the video. But anyway, uh, with that said, I want to focus on one prophecy that Isaiah spoke that we are all familiar with the words. And I want to kind of dive into the words a little bit uh, and just share some insights into this holy day and what the A, the ancient Israelites were looking forward to, and B, what they received. So if you would like to open up your Bibles, please, electronic version and or paper, to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, Isaiah is the, oh, what shall I say, the one prophet who talked most about the coming Messiah, the coming chosen one, the coming savior, if you will. Uh, he is the one who dedicated a lot of his writing to this, more so than the, the other ones did. And there are several places in Isaiah that refers to not only Jesus' coming, but Jesus' crucifixion as well. But for right now, we want to focus on Isaiah chapter 9. So uh, with all that segue, uh, you should be ready for Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to start right at verse number 1. We are going to the end of verse uh, number 7, 1 through 7. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy, they rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, will do this. Another way of ending it, thus saith the Lord. Boom, rubber stamp, uh, mic drop, whatever you want to use to describe exclamation point. 
But let's kind of look at this a little bit, because in this, there's a lot of subtle conversation regarding the coming Messiah. For example, right there in verse number one and verse number two, verse number one says, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. Who is the her? Well, we can refer to that as pointing toward Mary. Think about this, you know, here is Mary living in a very poor town of Nazareth. Uh, we don't know what her father did for a living. <clears throat> we just know that of Mary, she was highly favored by God, as we have seen and continue to see in the gospel according to St. Luke. But in the former days, but there was, will be no gloom for her. Well, look at what she said when Gabriel announced that she will become the mother of God, that she will become the one who is going to carry this person, as Isaiah just spelled out later. Let it be done to me as you have said. Wow. That's faith, number one. Number two, I think that's the connection point. That's the linking point between Luke and Isaiah. But at, we, we need to continue this little section here. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. Got to understand, where is these tribes' locations? Where, where, where were they? Bear with me, and I'll be right back. Why don't you talk about that, and let's flip to your Bible map. All right, do you have your Bible maps? Now, you can use Google, I, I know, but in this kind of a context, I'm old school. I'm sorry, but I, I've got to go back to paper. And right up there, now if you look right there, right on the other side of my, the tip of my finger, that's Naphtali right there. And guess what? On the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Zebulun, is that blue right there? So this is the region we know as Galilee. Guess from where Mary was. Galilee. So in the land, so he who brought contempt. Now, if you also go back to the map. So here we have the northernmost tribes. Naphtali is the, one of the northernmost. Zebulun is like, like you saw on the map. It's just right there. Now we move forward to Solomon, the United Kingdom. We don't hear much about the tribes and their distinctions anymore. Then we hear after Solomon dies, the split of the nation of Israel. This is what Isaiah, I believe, is referring to about the turmoil. Here we have the turmoil of a, now a divided kingdom, not a unified kingdom. And the northern tribes are taken captive by the nation of Assyria in 722. The southern, mainly Judah, in 522 taken to Babylon. But then they come back. And here is now, in the former time, he brought contempt in the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But now we move forward to the time of Jesus, to the time of Mary. Now, in the latter time, he has made the glorious way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. So now we have uh, this glorification of a person from this region which was under turmoil at one point in time. That's where Isaiah is referring us to. Then he changes gears in verse number two when he talks about now the context of light. And the context of light is the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, and they are glad when they divide the spoil. 
So now this light has come into the nation. Who is this light? We know him as Jesus. So where does this reference of light come from? How do we know about this light has shone? Well, <laughs> we need to go to John chapter 1. So in John chapter 1, John describes this great light. So take a moment. We'll pause right here. Turn to John chapter 1 in your Bible, and we'll be right back. All right, so you've got your Bibles marked at John chapter 1. Now, don't forget, we're going to go back to Isaiah 9 in just a moment. But I want to see, show you these connections and how <clears throat> these Old and New Testaments are not isolated. They're interconnected. They're interrelated. They are a unified source of the revelation of God. Now, let's, go to, let's get to John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Here's the connection with the light. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then we skip. Uh, it talks about uh, John the Baptist there for a couple of verses, about being a witness to the light. Then we skip, jump to verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the one, the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Wow. So, we have seen the light. We know the light. The light is Jesus. And as Isaiah, now I've already bounced back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. So if, if hopefully you bookmarked chapter 9 in Isaiah so you don't have to sit there and go flip, flip, flip. That's your boom right there with me. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. There it is. There is the, the linkage from the old prophecy to the current reality. And that is a beautiful thing, how they are intimately linked together. <clears throat> so verse 3, you have multiplied. No, Isaiah is speaking to God. He's speaking to him. And on, in many various ways, on behalf of God. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest and as they are glad when they divide the spoil. So there's going to be a layer of rejoicing coming up. And for us, that's exactly what it is. We are in the mode of rejoicing at the birth of our Savior. Now, the rejoicing has a hill to climb. And I, and I put that in quotation marks, and that's also reality. The rejoicing has a moment of deep, dark despair. Because people who, at the time, believed in Jesus, but didn't really connect to the context of, the re of, uh, uh, of resurrection, but Jesus had pointed them to it, they thought, it's all over and done with. Jesus got caught up into the hands of the priests, the Sanhedrin. They finally got him. They got him turned over to Pilate. They got the crowd turned against Jesus, who not only about five days before were shouting hosannas, now they're shouting crucify him. Put him on a cross, he dies. For a lot of people, that's where the story ends. And the resurrection, for many, many people, it's a fool's hope, if you will. 
but for Christians, for you and I, who are not only living the message, but also sharing the message, it is the joy again. Jesus died, yes, absolutely. The Son of God died, shed his blood, gave up his body, so that you and I would be forgiven. All people would be forgiven. Yes, all people will be forgiven because of what Jesus had done for us. And as we look at verse number four now, for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. We'll get to Midian in just a moment. But what I want to focus on right now is that yoke of his burden. His burden was to carry your sins, my sins, to the cross, to die upon the cross and give up his body and shed his blood, as I said earlier. His burden, as he also says, my burden, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. To what does he refer? His yoke is easy. His yoke for us. It's easy. We don't have to carry the weight of our sins any longer. Jesus already did, did that. We don't have to be burdened by guilt and weight and sorrow and grief. He's taken that all upon us and given us life. That's why his yoke is easy and his burden is light for us. That's what Jesus is referring to. And that's what this prophecy here in Isaiah 9, 4 is connecting us to. Now, to talk about just briefly the days of Midian's defeat, you have broken as on the day of Midian. What is this connection to Midian? Who is Midian? What is Midian? Well, first and foremost, there is a link to the nation of Midian because of Moses. Moses married the daughter of a priest from Midian. So there's a linkage there, but that's not what uh, Isaiah is referring to. What Isaiah is referring to more is in Judges chapter 6 in Gideon. Gideon and the Midianites. The nation of Midian had occupied the nation of Israel, had been put it under oppression. Uh, it was dominating it. Okay, and I'll put the reference down here on the bottom as to the passage in Judges, and I don't want to take a whole lot of time. But just like in the day of Midian's defeat, uh, defeat by Gideon and the Savior, quote-unquote, uh, the book of Judges is all about these little mini saviors as it relates to Jesus. So now in the day of Midian, you have broken our oppression. So now, as I mentioned before, it's about Jesus breaking the oppression of sin and death and hell and the influence of Satan. It is about breaking that. And that is what Jesus has come to do. And that is what Isaiah is pointing to. And out of Isaiah 9, we get to the part that is the most famous and that is from Isaiah 9, verse 6 through verse 7. Isaiah 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. That's the key point. The zeal of the Lord will do this. This is not anything that we're doing. It is the work totally in the wonders of God, as we've been pointing out throughout today's video. But I do want to get to, for us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, all these linkages, all these connections to the Old and the New Testament. Everything is climaxing right here in this child. The woman we talked about in verse 1, her child. Her child is this, the Son of God, the Son of Man, 
all of it is really building up to this wonderful climax. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now, I do have to say one thing. And this was the digression of the nation of Israel, where they're still, in some respects, still waiting, depending upon what point of view you're taking. They're still waiting for the Messiah to show up. Why? He is going to literally rule from the throne of David, from the palace, from the temple. They're still waiting for that. They missed the fact that he's already come, and the real rule from the throne of David is not here on earth. As Isaiah is very clear, it's not just about here on earth. It's about forever. It's about for all time. It's for people, and he will accomplish this. God will make this happen. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Peace. Wow. That's really where it's at, isn't it? And that's where I think many people, including many Christians, miss the boat. What peace are we talking about when the peace of uh, is nowhere to be found? You know, we got this turmoil called COVID. We got this turmoil called all these other issues that are going on in our lives. Where is the peace that God promised? Right here in the hearts and the minds of the believers. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is again the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. These are the words of St. Paul. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. We don't get it. We don't understand it. We're looking for peace in all the wrong places. We're looking for peace to be the absence of hostility. But the only real peace that we can have is having faith in God, in Christ Jesus, and all the turmoil he went through in order to guarantee our peace of heart and mind. So that by his turmoil, we have peace and we can look at this world and this craziness that's going on around us, and we can look at it with a mindset and a heart that is full of God and his peace. That is the peace that passes all understanding, and that is why Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. And the Lord will accomplish this, and he has. And that's what we will celebrate tomorrow, tomorrow evening, 6 p.m., and then again at 7.30. Uh, love, to, love to have you with us. Please join us at one of those two celebrations in-house and online. And to all of you, from me, myself, uh, my family, and the like, I just want to wish you a very blessed and Merry Christmas. And we will talk to you on Sunday. <laughs>